I'm Leslie Gordon. I'm the director of the Rialto Center for the Arts at Georgia State University. At the Rialto, we became aware of an arts program through Arts Midwest that was called Caravanserai that was based on bringing artists from Muslim countries into the United States. And each year they would choose four cities to host a program from one specific Muslim country. We applied for that program to be one of the four cities and we were thrilled when we were chosen and that the country was Malaysia. It was a wonderful opportunity to see different faces of Malaysia and to really understand what a, a, a multicultural group of people there are there. One of the things that we're thrilled about is that we were chosen to document the uh, residencies of the artists that will be coming in over this year. As a, a sort of through thread for the documentary, three different subjects were chosen to represent three aspects of the types of people who may encounter these artists while they're here in residence. My name is Sumaya Khalifa and uh, I was born in Egypt. I moved to Texas as a child with my parents because my mom got an opportunity to uh, further her medical research. We came to Atlanta because of my husband's work and we have been in the metro Atlanta area 26 years. Um, my background is uh, in human resources, worked for corporate America for many years in human resources and uh, went out on my own uh, about eight years ago to do consulting, intercultural consulting. My name is Alexis. Um, I am 21. I go to Georgia State University where I'm double majoring in film and video and journalism with the PR concentration. My name is John Clark. I um, grew up north of Atlanta, about 40 miles north of Atlanta in Cartersville, Georgia. Um, I uh, graduated from high school and decided to go to college at the University of Georgia. I graduated in 2006 um, with my degree in economics. We in the arts know that the arts can dispel a lot of misunderstandings. We also know we can say things in the arts that can't be said in any other ways. So in the case of these particular subjects who will be followed throughout this film, we're looking to gauge if something will change. Of course, the program is as much about perceptions of the United States and Americans for people from Muslim countries as it is about our perception of people from Muslim countries. So it's a two-way street. The first thing that I can think of is oppression when I hear the word Muslim and I don't really know why maybe it's just how or what I see or what how I hear people talk about people of the Muslim culture or uh, I, I don't know why I think that but um, I grew up Christian um, and I still hold the my moral compass points towards my Christian values. I don't, I don't know a whole lot about the Muslim religion and its practices, but um, I mean, I know probably the basics. You know that um, um, Muhammad, the prophet, um, was was told, told by God to start Islam, and um, the Quran was was you know came from that. And that's I mean that really is as much as I know. I'm a practicing Muslim. That means that, you know, pray five times a day and do the, the five pillars as best as I can. There is a prophetic saying uh, of a definition of a Muslim, and that is a person who others live around them in, in peace. In peace in terms of uh, no harm from the tongue or from the hand. So that is the essence of being a Muslim in my opinion. The first artists to come were diplomats of drum. We had no idea what to expect because we'd only seen little clips on YouTube. Uh, DOD stands for four simple words, love, peace, happiness, and unity. We're multi-racial, we're multi multi-faith, and uh, if we can come together and make uh, music, I'm sure the rest of the world can do so as well. We're from four different races and five different religions, right? In the world, even if you belong to three different faiths, you can't live in one country, you know, there's problems. And I think that's, that's the, the key message that we share, you know? That you can be as different as you want, right? What you need to do is tolerate each other, accept each other, and learn from each other. We've got 47 different instruments, about 15 percussion, 20 percussion instruments, and then it's everything else. Uh, these guys are multi-talented. 
Uh, each person plays close to three to four different instruments. I play the sape. Um, the sape is a traditional lute instrument of the Orang Ulu people. I'm from the Kalabi tribe and it comes from Borneo. Um, so I play that in the band and the boys have let me on percussion as well. I love working with the kids because uh, you see they're just so energetic and bright-eyed and they just they, they get so excited uh, to hear our music and to have us at their schools and their workshops so I really enjoy that. When we were aware that we were going to be part of this program one of the things we thought that was really important to do was to reach out and not keep it in one place in fact we decided that we would reach beyond the campus of Georgia State and provide an opportunity for neighboring communities even to experience um, these art forms. Their main performance the week they were here was a fantastic success. Those performers put on an unbelievable show. really liked how they traced where the music came from, uh, the history, um, the, the population. When they talked about the different ethnicities, they talked about where that, that sat, and they took us on a tour. The peace, love, and happiness, and unity, that, that has to stick with me, because throughout this whole week, that's what I feel like has been delivered to me, what they have been trying to show us. Like, that's what they're about. So that is definitely going to stick with me. Um, I was thinking, you know, my, my wife and daughter at home, and, um, you know, she's 17 months old, so she's young, and um, so she's asleep right now. But I, I saw some kids running around up front, and I just thought, you know, man, I wish my, you know, people that I love were, were here listening to this and, you know, enjoying it. Um, it wasn't like a lonely feeling, but it was a feeling like, man, I wish I could share this. This entire week has changed a little po a little piece because I haven't, you know, had the opportunity to really like dive into exactly what the Muslim culture is about. But now, <laughs> when someone says that word, it'll probably go to love first. Diplomats of Drum came to Atlanta. We had no idea who we would meet, what kind of people they were what they did, what their backgrounds were. We left feeling like we were intimately involved in their lives. We found out they're made up of uh, engineers and trained musicians who've been to conservatories and people who worked for major international consulting firms and all kinds of things. We even found out that the woman in the troupe is a princess from Borneo. And uh, we felt like these were people that we had known all our lives. Not only that, there's not a single person that I've talked to who encountered them who doesn't want to go to Malaysia. This is the second part of the program featuring a filmmaker. How many of you have uh, know where Malaysia is or have been to Malaysia? A few, a few, okay, not so many. We are extremely uh, multicultural. We have about 65% of the population are ethnically Malay. Uh, about 25% ethnically Chinese, uh, about 10% Indians, and so on. Uh, many languages, we s most Malaysians speak two, if not three languages. Uh, I speak seven, and that's not even uh, unusual. Pete Teo, the Malaysian filmmaker, came here with a film called 15 Malaysia, where he had actually worked with 15 up-and-coming filmmakers and one very established filmmaker actually um, to create short videos that were designed for online only. I think one of the things that he was able to share with the film students and the film community was the fact that there are so many Asian film festivals that are really interested in work from the U.S. 
Um, he pointed out that so many people pay attention to the big name film festivals, but they don't think about all of these other festivals that are pretty significant. These 15 films essentially were themed upon all those subjects which were taboo or were regarded as taboo. <laughs> Alcohol. You know the danger, I know the danger, but the rakyat might not know, sir. We need to inform them. Yes, imagine. Ali, next one. What's that? A car crash. How many people will think twice to pick up another beer bottle? In Malaysia, the press is heavily censored. Almost 100% of the mainstream media is controlled by uh, the government or interests close to the government. Um, the freedom of speech is heavily censored, heavily restricted. Uh, and there are laws uh, that allow the authorities to put people in prison without a trial indefinitely. Uh, so it was at the time we were releasing them, it, it felt very, very dangerous. I think people were really taken with him and with his ability to kind of share and give an overview of a country hardly anybody in the U.S. knows anything about. I really appreciated uh, Pete coming out and speaking about each one of them. I don't think I could have gotten as much insider information in a sense about Malaysia had I read a book or just watched a film. But having the short films and followed by discussion and his stories and, um, you know, who's in the film, why it was done, um, what are the implications, the political one, the social one, uh, the economic one, uh, really provided such incredible insight into the country. Even if you're not really interested in the Malaysian culture, each one of them, each, each film sparked some kind of an emotion within me. Um, and I believe that, that it would do the same for everyone else. And it, pro it did for sure in this theater today. Um, sparked emotions in every person. You know, we were, we, we laughed, we, some of us sound like some of us cried, some of us at least were in shock from some of the spots that we're supposed to be in shock from, um, but you laughed at the spots you're supposed to laugh at. I definitely do think that the United States struggles with a lot of the same things that they do in Malaysia. I mean, at the end of the day, we're still humans and we all, we, everyone wants that, you know, kind of sort of the same thing. We want freedom, we want like our basic rights, we want to be heard. And I feel like that's, uh, this was a lot of, well those were the, a lot of the things that he was saying th in his films or, and it's just interesting to see like, no matter where you are in the world, you still have the same issues as like people or countries that are miles and miles away. Like we're, one essentially. The other thing that we did with him because of, he's got a strong interest in organic gardening is we actually s sent him to um, visit with a young man who runs an organic farm. So he actually spent most of a day on an organic farm just south of the city learning about how we do things and what our, our methods are versus how they're doing, he and his wife are doing things in Malaysia. You know he kind of joked and said that um, you know, most people look, think about Malaysia and they think about, you know, palm trees and, um, you know, and sand and beaches. And that's kind of the feeling we, we got from, from the diplomats of Drum. Um, it was, you know, this just awesome feeling, this, this hopeful feeling, um, peaceful feeling. And then you, you, you come and watch these and, you know, it's so thought provoking, so much more than just relaxing or so much more than, than like you said, palm trees and sand. Um, so I think he, as a producer, he's pretty amazing. You know, I enjoyed it, for sure. closing program of the year-long residency was the Wayan Kulit Shadow Puppets of Kelantan. Traveling with them were uh, two journalists. 
I'm Pauline Fan. I'm the managing director of Pusaka. Pusaka is a cultural heritage organization. We work with traditional performing artists throughout Malaysia. I'm Edin Koo. I set up Pusaka uh, after doing some very formative work with this uh, community. They are from the northeast state of Kuantan, and they brought me today a very old form of storytelling. It's called the Wayakuri. It is a form of shadow puppetry. When they do a performance like this, it can last for days. People come in the audience and they go, and they also will walk up and look behind, and that is completely acceptable. Also, it's acceptable to even talk a little bit out there, to laugh, to clap, to do whatever you want. It's very interactive. Uh, the Tree of Life always begins and ends the Wyandotte performance. And so um, there will be an opening sequence of about five minutes with music and uh, the Dalai will lift off the Tree of Life. That symbolizes the lifting of the veil of the universe. The Tree of Life does symbolize the universe. <laughs> This residency was designed like our very first residency with Diplomats of Drum to kind of take the art form around, not just keep it in the city of Atlanta and, and within one place at the Rialto, but to actually share it with different communities. So the residency was designed to go to Noonan, Georgia, a very small town. They had overwhelming numbers of school children attending the performances and making puppets. And then we went into a school here. These students have very little exposure, not only to anything international, but anything arts at all. Sati Nikuchi, a cultural center up in the mountains of North Georgia, educated and but also somewhat isolated community. Clarkston, a community center that serves much of the refugee population. <laughs> Having those young kids, fourth graders and fifth graders, watch art from all the way across the world, it opens up their minds. It makes them realize that not everything is just here and now, but there is a history in other parts of the world that can empower them in a sense and open up their horizons and their viewpoint. Well, one of the things that's very little talked about uh, about the Muslim world is of course the battle that is going on within the Muslim world. Uh, and in the past uh, 25 years, traditions such as the Wayang have been banned uh, on charges of having pre-Islamic leanings and, and uh, uh, being antithetical to Puritan Islamic practice. It was kind of like a hard pill to swallow just to think like everything that I believe in could be going away if someone else came and said that that's not okay. No one should have to experience that, I don't think. It gave me a special appreciation for the freedoms that we have in this country that we take for granted a lot of times that are not available to other people across the world. You know, the most memorable part for me would be um, going up on stage and, and walking around the, to the other side. When, when you're sitting, you see the you see the story unfold, you know, around you um, or around them, and you, you you witness that. From where I was sitting, it looked like maybe a table and a lantern. You know, but you go back there, and it's, it's actually these wires in this box that has a light coming out of it. I think the enjoyment of this whole thing is 80% behind the scenes. It really is, because seeing the workings of how it it, it's, it goes on, it is uh, you know being on the front. It's just like okay, it's shadow. It's just like you know people doing their hands and making a dog or whatever. But it's just so much more. And then having the questions and answers about how the puppets are made, and um, you know what it goes into making them, and how long it takes for for people to be trained to do this kind of art, um, it's really, really phenomenal. It's, it's really eye-opening. It was a little bit hard for me to follow the story. My favorite part about it is like being able to walk around and interact and not having to be seated and like actually going behind and seeing that it's one person doing this. That just blows my mind. <laughs> that one person is like orchestrating the entire thing with the exception of the ensemble playing the music and stuff, but one person 
is doing all of the character voices, the narrations, and everything. And even though I can't understand it, I still can't help but kind of sort of be blown away by it. It was a wonderful opportunity to see different faces of Malaysia and to really understand what a, a, a multicultural group of people there are there. And the more you talk to people, the more you learn about all the ties, all the influences. You know, there's just so much I did not know. You know, and I knew that um, you know, Islam was, was their, main, their main religion over there, but I didn't, I didn't know what all went into it. You know? I know like the first thing I said the last time, and I will not ever forget this, is that when I thought of Malaysia and the Muslim culture was oppression. And I don't feel like that anymore. I feel like a sense of love, I guess you could say, because I felt like a lot of the things that I saw was were people trying to reach out. It felt like they were trying to reach out to people, showing, hey, this is what we are. We're having issues right now, but we're still us. And I felt a lot of that throughout this whole project. I thought how Malaysia was portrayed was really beautiful because it brought the whole people. It was that here's only one segment of their identity, which is their religion, and we're going to cut and uh, slice and dice whatever it is that we're bringing to just show that one particular part of the identity of the country or the identity of the people. I think we would have missed out a lot. But bringing the whole thing added so much richness and so much value uh, to the experience. You really don't even see them as, you know, Muslim folks. You see, you know, not, not at all. You don't even think about, I didn't think about religion not one time. Um, when getting into the, you know, watching the performance pieces of it. It was more thinking about the, the political aspect of what goes on in the country versus um, religion. Um, so I think it succeeded as far as, you know, showing that we're all, we're all human. But overall, I just wish there was more time with it. And that's not necessarily something you can control with the res residencies and all that, but um, I mean, it was fantastic, totally. Planting those seeds in people's minds at all age groups, like what's been done here with Caravanserai, is really beyond measure. Because you don't know the impact of that experience on the so many different people. We need to understand what the rest of the world is like. And what more beautiful and non-threatening way to bring the world to us but through the arts. to Pete Tao a little bit um, more than the others. Like, I got an opportunity to talk with him a little bit after um, his screenings, and um, we just kinda, I don't know, I feel like we hit it off a little bit. He followed me on Instagram, so that was pretty cool. The different formats appeal to different audiences, and by having the different formats, we have a wider uh, possibility of touching many different ways, different people, and how they learn, how they um, know uh, what resonates with them. I, have, I listen to Spotify, and one of my playlists now is just says "world," and so I, it's just just different combinations of, of music I've never listened to before. But if it's got a good beat, I really like it. Everything that we did was enlightening in some way to some part of the audience. The audiences were all thrilled. And I think that the ongoing dialogue that I'm sure resulted from a lot of these performances will keep going.